there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. The 20th century saw the dawn of a new type of warfare. Machines ruled the battlefield. Conventional infantry assault across no man's land was bound to fail. Flesh and blood simply could not get through that type of defense. A fierce arms race led to even more deadly weapons. Those gunners on the tanks had rounds in their cannons, and they were ready to execute if they were told to. Behind the lines, the development of powerful and innovative vehicles meant the difference between victory and defeat. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. The relentless pursuit of military supremacy would lead to machines capable of destroying humanity itself. There are very few mistakes you could make that wouldn't have some kind of catastrophic consequence. This time, the epic Second World War battle in the North African desert. Rommel is very much a doer, a fast-moving general, somebody who wants to get things done and is prepared to take risks. Facing Rommel, Montgomery's Desert Rats, one of the toughest units in the British Army. And it was meant to be a five-day operation. It turned out to be one of the finest British armoured operations of the Second World War. In a straight-up stand-up fight, the British had finally been the last man left in the ring. Success relied on both sides' combat machines and their extraordinary firepower. This tungsten core round would punch through the side of the turret and beat around inside until everything was either broken or on fire. Victory in the desert was hard fought, and it changed the outcome of the Second World War. On June 22, 1940, France surrendered to Nazi Germany after a battle lasting just six weeks. The German army, the Wehrmacht, stormed over First World War battlefields where their predecessors had been bogged down for four years. Both the French army and the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF, had been outmaneuvered. We lacked air cover. We lacked the right weapons and training to go with them. And also the fact was that the BEF had not expected virtually to have to take on the might of the Wehrmacht without the support of the French, whose army was crumbling. In the battle for France, British tanks were exposed as mechanically unreliable and often unable to penetrate the armor of the German panzers. It was a humiliation. But soon, a very different battlefront opened up, an opportunity for a second chance. How would the British Army's combat machines fare in the deserts of North Africa? The war in the desert began in September 1940 because of the territorial ambitions of the Italian dictator, Benito Mussolini. Mussolini felt deprived of victory. Germany had conquered France, he'd conquered nowhere. Britain was on the ropes in 1940, of course, had withdrawn from France and was beginning to fight the Battle of Britain. This seemed the opportunity for the Italians to move into Egypt. Hitler had no interest in North Africa or the Mediterranean. With the Battle for France over, his eyes were fixed firmly eastwards towards Russia. It was Mussolini who was trailing along in the coattails of his glorious ally, his armies deprived of any kind of victory. He wanted a win, and he wanted to take North Africa. Mussolini had a huge army in Libya of 250,000 men. His plan was to invade Egypt and seize the strategically important Suez Canal, getting access to the vital oil fields of the Middle East. 
Opposing the Italians was the 36,000 strong Western Desert Force, made up of British, Australian and Indian infantry and armoured units. They would soon acquire the nickname first given to the British 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats, inspired by the African rodent, the Jaboa. One of the tanks the Desert Rats placed their faith in because of its heavy armour and two-pound gun was this machine, a 29-ton British infantry tank known as the Matilda. At the Tank Museum in Bovington in England, a World War II Matilda is being lovingly restored. It gives fascinating insights into the machine and those who made it. It came in for what was a routine bit of maintenance and it turned into, um, so far, a three-year rebuild. The aim is to get as many systems on this vehicle working as if it came out of the factory. There's a certain amount of engineering and archaeology that has to take place when you build something of this kind of historic value. Bolts are cut at certain lengths that are not come off the shelf in order that they're fit. Sometimes the sides of them are flattened in order that things can operate. The designers of the Matilda struggled to find an engine big enough to power it. They finally hit upon a solution. Not one, but two 95 horsepower diesel engines. That gave it a top speed of 16 miles per hour, faster than the Italian tanks. This is one of the pair of engines that's fitted to the Matilda tank. We're just getting it prepared for testing and running. In 1939, many British companies shifted their production to the war effort. Matilda tanks were constructed by firms such as Harland and Wolfe, who also built the Titanic, and the Vulcan foundry in Lancashire, famous for its powerful locomotives. The repair team at Bovington Tank Museum is constantly learning about the ingenuity of the men and women who made the Matildas. One key element of the Matilda's turret has been stripped down and repaired. This component here is called the rotary base junction. Its function is to transfer the electrical and the hydraulic power into the turret. The rotary base junction allows the Matilda's turret to traverse 360 degrees in any direction. This is the fixed part, and the top rotates and carries the hydraulic connections all the way around the turret. Inside this drum is a tower with electrical contacts in. The fixed wires come out from the hull, and they're bolted here. They relate to contacts that run down the side of here, and as the turret rotates, it maintains an electrical contact all the way around. In order to strip a component like this down, the electricians and the fitters at the time would have had a number of specialist tools in order to carry this out. We've had to make these special tools, and there's some examples of them here. They get from the um, Sublime, sometimes to uh, something a little more crude, but it's amazing how sometimes a bit of wood can help. In order to fix this particular component, we had to make upwards of nine tools. Normally, these would have been issued to the tank crews with the tank uh, when the vehicle went to the regiments. By the summer of 1940, the Desert Rats had about 270 tanks at their disposal, of which 50 were Matildas. On September 13, 1940, the Desert Campaign began. The Italians invaded British-controlled Egypt. After 60 miles, they stopped and dug in, creating a series of fortified camps. The man in charge of the British counter-attack knew the terrain well. His name was Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor. O'Connor was a professional soldier, pre-war regular. He'd uh, served with distinction in the Great War, but he knew the desert. He knew the capabilities of his British forces, and he knew the limitations of the Italian forces, and exploited both to great effect. O'Connor devised an ingenious plan, christened Operation Compass. 
Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor was arguably one of Britain's best generals of the Second World War. In Operation Compass, he was set a pretty ambitious task. With limited numbers of men, he was going to attempt to drive the Italians right out of Egypt. And it was meant to be a five-day operation. It turned out to be much more of a momentous operation than that. In fact, one of the finest British armoured operations of the Second World War. Operation Compass essentially set out to destroy the Italians, to destroy their attack uh, from Libya. As the Italians moved rather cumbrously along the coast road, the British forces simply penned them there, whilst O'Connor launched a major flanking attack, striking southward through the desert to roll up a line of frontier forts which the Italians had built, and to destroy their army by attack on the flank and rear. The hammer blow was provided by 50 Matilda tanks, which emerged out of the desert at speed. The Italians were thrown into confusion and panic. So we've got this situation where after some of the initial attacks, they're sending the Matilda tanks forward, almost with bravado, to crush down the Italian artillery, and that very quickly sends a level of despair through the Italian military that's infectious. They think they cannot fight against this new British tank that's appearing, which in the end gets its nickname, the Queen of the Desert. Nothing can seem to touch it. One Australian soldier wrote home, the sound of British tanks terrorised them, and the sight of our bayonets was enough to make them throw up their hands. Fascism. Pah. Operation Compass had pushed the Italians back. It took them completely by surprise. Their army began to crumble very quickly, and soon the Italians were thinking simply in terms of escape into the relative safety of Libya. Victory over the Italians had done something to repair the damage done by the humiliation of defeat in France. But how would the Desert Rats fare against a more deadly and sophisticated foe? The legendary German tank commander Erwin Rommel and the lethal combat machines he brought with him. The range and the flat trajectory of the 88 allowed it to reach out to enemy tanks before they were even within range of firing back. The round is leaving the barrel at the speed of 2,200 feet per second. After France fell to the German Blitzkrieg in June 1940, the British and their allies were in need of a victory. They were given a second chance in North Africa when in December, the Desert Rats and their combat machines routed the Italian 10th Army, who had hoped to capture Egypt and the Suez Canal. Then, to the surprise of the British, there was a chance to turn a victory into a stampede. An officer, Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor, had hastily assembled a flying column of fast vehicles to intercept the fleeing Italians. He gave his men orders to stop them at all costs. Leading the charge were scout cars like this one, built by British manufacturer Daimler and known as the Dingo. The Dingo is designed as a light reconnaissance vehicle and was part of the ethos of the British Army uh, for light mobility, so it acted as eyes and ears. The name Dingo is derived from Australian wild dogs, which is perhaps rather apt as this was used in the desert. As you can see, it's quite a compact vehicle, not very big, uh, just takes two crew. Uh, you've got the driver here on the right, gunner on the left, equipped with the 303 Brun gun for self defence. Armour, um, not too bad on the front. You've got 30 millimetre plates here, but only 12 millimetre on the side, so not so great on the sides. Obviously, you've got 360 visibility from the top, which is what made it ideal for desert warfare. You can see for miles on the flat desert terrain. If you saw a dingo coming over the horizon, it meant that there was a patrol on the way, which obviously signalled that there were larger forces behind them. So it usually alerted to you that trouble was en route.
Accompanying the dingo as part of O'Connor's flying columns was a vehicle with a better pedigree than any other British combat machine, the Rolls-Royce armoured car. Built on the chassis of the luxury limousine, the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, she was powered by a 7.5-litre straight-six engine that gave her a top speed of 45 miles per hour. Both the Royal Air Force and the British Army used these vehicles. By 1940, the armoured cars had been in service for 20 years and nearing the end of their operational life. But they remained popular with the Desert Rats, with good reason. The tanks, even then, were still not particularly serviceable all the time. They broke down quite often. That meant that the Rolls Royces themselves were much preferred because they could travel faster, they could travel further, it didn't take as much fuel, and if you like, the physical footprint, which is the dust, etc., generated by their movement across the desert, was nowhere near as great as the tanks. With a crew of four men, one of whom was a gunner, the Rolls could pack a punch. It had a Vickers mini machine gun, the ones you know from World War I and the trenches in the Somme. And latterly, it had a boys only tank rifle, which was capable of taking out most other armored cars and some light tanks. The Dingoes, light tanks and armored cars that made up Lieutenant General O'Connor's flying columns, headed south into the desert to race ahead of the Italian 10th Army as they fled back towards Tripoli in Libya. A bold flanking move through the desert, moving fast, hitting hard, exactly what light cavalry would have done in the previous century. They set up roadblocks at a place named Beda Fom, just 30 minutes before the remnant of the Italian 10th Army arrived. It still had a sizable amount of armor, and it still had a sizable amount of men. The problem it had was it did not expect, out of the morning mist, British armored vehicles to be blocking the course road to the south. The armored cars sealed off the pass, and the Italians would have to fight their way through them to get towards sanctuary. And effectively, after two days of fighting, the Italians almost are master in the town. O'Connor's plan had exceeded expectations. At the end of the Battle of Beda Fom, British officers were reporting the number of Italian prisoners they had in terms of acreage. They were saying, I have two acres of officers and 10 acres of other ranks. So many Italians in the hundreds of thousands surrendering. Despite the victory, the battle marked the end of an era for one of the Desert Rat's best loved combat machines. Bedefront saw the swan song of the Rolls Royce as a frontline armoured reconnaissance vehicle with the 7th Armoured Division and with the whole of the British Army in the Western Desert. It had operated in some cases for more than 20 years and was wearing out and wasn't as up to date as some of the more modern designs. Operation Compass and the Battle of Bay de Fom had helped to build the reputation of the Desert Rats. But on the 12th of February 1941, only five days after the victory at Bay de Fom, a more formidable force arrived in North Africa. The German Africa Corps, led by Lieutenant General Erwin Rommel and his columns of deadly panzer tanks. Rommel had made a name for himself commanding a fast attacking tank division in France in May 1940. Rommel is very much a doer, a fast moving general, somebody who wants to get things done and is prepared to take risks. But in the desert, the Fuhrer wanted his famous general to employ a more cautious strategy. In terms of the Africa Corps, the Germans, Hitler, had never intended to become involved in the North African War. That was Mussolini's folly, as far as he was concerned. Rommel's mission was simply to bolster the Italians. This is an Italian war. Rommel decided to ignore Hitler's orders 
He believed it was very much a German war. He would take on the British and their allies. But first, Rommel unloaded a weapon he knew would protect his troops and soften up the enemy. This is the legendary 88mm flak gun. It was a favorite weapon of Rommel's. When he first arrived at Tripoli, and his Africa Corps was just coming into port to support the Italians, one of the first things he did was to send an anti-tank battalion and a mechanized reconnaissance battalion out to the east of Tripoli to screen against the British coming west. And the anti-tank battalion had 88s in it. So one of the first things he did was deploy 88s in a defensive role to guard his entire sphere of operations. Built initially to arm pre-First World War dreadnoughts of the German Navy, the 88 is one of the most versatile weapons in the history of warfare and can be as equally devastating on land as at sea. So feared were they, the guns were outlawed as part of the Versailles Treaty in 1919, but not for long. When in 35, Hitler decides to denounce the Versailles Treaty. The guns are then being produced in most of the major metallurgy plants in Germany. In the rearmed Third Reich, the 88s were to be used as defense against aircraft. The Germans claimed that a shell fired from its 16-foot barrel could reach a height of 32,000 feet. It is designed primarily as a flak, which means Flieger Abwehr Kanon, basically anti-aircraft cannon. Then, during the Battle for France in 1940, Rommel gave the 88 a new role as an anti-tank gun. Rommel sees, though, if you use the 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun, it has actually an armor-piercing round. He insists they turn and they fire at the oncoming British tanks. And he sees again there, he's got that lesson already before he goes to North Africa, he can see the benefit of firepower such as the 88 millimeter against vehicles such as the Matilda II. This is one of the shells for the 88 flag. This one is an anti-tank shell a solid 22-pound bullet. If we're firing any tank, there is no arming of the shell. One of the ammunition loaders will pick the shell up, shove it in the back of the breech of the weapon. Another cannoneer is closing the breech right behind it. In the anti-tank roll, the man who is sitting in the gun layer's seat is the one that's actually aiming the gun, and he signals the man behind him to pull the trigger. The round is leaving the barrel at the speed of roughly 2,200 plus feet per second. Range and the flat trajectory of the 88 allowed it to reach out to enemy tanks before they were even within range of firing back at the 88. Almost two miles. They can knock a tank apart from over 2,000 meters. They were very effective use of a weapon that was not actually designed for an anti-tank role. One British tank commander wrote, I saw three of the leading Matildas stop abruptly and burst into flames. I realized with dismay that the Germans now had an anti-tank gun to which even the Matildas were not immune. I understood clearly that none of our future battles would be as easy as the previous year. Even though the 88's shells carried no explosive, they could inflict terrible damage. This tungsten core round would punch through the side of the turret and 
beat around inside until everything inside was either broken or on fire. And the lighting on fire is not because it explodes, it's because it's just creating so many sparks as it spins around inside that metal box that anything that's in the tank is going to light up. It's purely kinetic energy weapon. The power of the 88s gave Rommel's men a definite advantage over the desert rats. But Rommel didn't only bring an anti-tank gun to the desert. He had at his disposal another lethal combat machine, the Panzer III. In February 1941, the German Africa Corps, led by Lieutenant General Erwin Rommel, joined their Italian allies in a campaign to win control of North Africa. Facing them was a British, Australian, Indian and South African force known as the Desert Rats. One of the big features of the Desert War from 1940 to 1942 is the way the tide turns so quickly from one side to another. The Italians have initial success. The Italians are then beaten effectively by the British. The British take their eyes off the ball. Rommel enters, a favorite of Hitler, somebody who's an ambitious, fast-moving man. Rommel brought with him one of the combat machines the Allies feared most, the 25-ton tank known as the Panzer III. As soon as the sun rises through the morning mist, the regiment starts to roll forward. We disperse into the desert, 40 to 50 kilometers an hour on our tackle. But the nicest is the attack, the German Panzer, our beautiful, wide, humming Panzer. Panzer, Panzer to the fore. The 18-foot-long Panzer III was designed in 1937 to be the main German frontline tank for any future conflict. As they think the Panzer III is going to be the vehicle that will be leading the attack, will be coming across potentially enemy tanks coming the other way back at it, they want to give it an anti-tank weapon. So they start off by giving it the standard 37 millimeter gun. That's the standard anti-tank gun for the whole German army. Many countries in the 1930s have anti-tank guns about this caliber. But the battle for France showed the Germans that the Panzer lacked sufficient firepower. The demand for a bigger gun came from the very top of the Nazi hierarchy. Now, very quickly, Hitler, who is so influential on German tank design, he is arguing for more protection on tanks, for more firepower. So under the Fuhrer's direction, the Panzer III was equipped with a 50 millimeter gun, far outmuscling the British tanks. Unfortunately for the British, a similar gun upgrade on the Matilda tank proved impossible. One of the biggest problems about putting a new gun on a tank is this idea of upgrading the vehicle by increasing its firepower. The turret circumference, the diameter there, tends to limit how big a gun you can fit in. The Matilda has a small turret circumference, which meant that an upgrade from its two-pounder just wasn't feasible. The Panzer III has a much larger turret ring that potential it has for getting more firepower means the Panzer III lasts longer in frontline service than the Matilda does. The tough conditions in North Africa meant that further adaptations to the design of the Panzer III were essential. The other issue about the desert, of course, is just the physical landscape they're going to have to cope with. That landscape with rock, with sand, with grit, all the time that's getting into the vehicle. You've got dust that can choke your filters. They're trying to keep those clean all the time so the engines don't stall. 
all these factors make desert warfare that much harder than perhaps the sort of scenarios, Northwest Europe, that these tanks have actually been designed for. So in the back, there's a made back TRM-120 engine that now has, for North African campaign, extra filtration put on it to help get the dust out before it actually reaches the engine to help cool that engine in the rear. This system helped the Panzer III achieve a top speed of 25 miles per hour. Although it was faster than most of the British tanks, the Panzer was still vulnerable to attack. A further modification was necessary. You'll see there's an extra almost inch of armor plate has been added as spaced armor at the front of the vehicle. That's where they thought they were most likely to be struck. That's where they put that extra protection on. The three-year desert conflict between the panzers of the German Africa Corps and the tanks of the Desert Rats took place over a stretch of land that bordered the sea, no more than 40 miles wide. And the problem is that the front line, if you like, was 1,500 miles long. And the desert war was called a pendulum. As the Allies advanced, the Germans retreated. As the Germans advanced, the Allies retreated. Rommel used ingenious tactics against the Allies, earning him the nickname the Desert Fox. His dynamism, his charismatic leadership, the lightning speed with which he moved and the instinctive feel he had for desert warfare made him a legend. Rommel would lure the British tanks to attack his anti-tank screen. As they broke through, they would be ambushed by 88mm flat guns. Meanwhile, the panzers would attack the British flank and rear. From the British point of view, we ended up, if we weren't careful, doing cavalry charges against German positions where the panzers would tempt the British forward, disappear behind a screen of anti-tank guns, and the British would afterwards be left licking their wounds, wondering what went wrong. Later on, as we get better at those tactics in the desert, we're less likely to fall for those sort of tricks that Rommel actually does of seducing the British into attack. In August 1942, after two years of fighting, Rommel had pushed the Desert Rats back to what was known as the El Alamein Line in Egypt. If the Germans broke through, North Africa was lost. The British, if they have to retreat further east, then Alexandria, Cairo, the whole of the Delta is open to the enemy. El Alamein for the British had to be the last ditch defense line. The situation was so serious. In Cairo, the British burnt official papers in case they fell into enemy hands. But could there be hope for the Desert Rats? Mechanized reinforcements appeared in the shape of a new, more powerful American tank, designed to take the fight to the Panzers, the M3 Grant. Well, and it really improved the British chances of being able to take the Germans on head to head. And a new British commander arrived to take on Rommel, Lieutenant General Sir Bernard Law Montgomery. If Monty was on the job, the ordinary Tommy thought he would get the job done. By August 1942, three years after the start of the Second World War, the commander of the German Africa Corps, Erwin Rommel, had pushed the Allied force known as the Desert Rats back to El Alamein in Egypt. The strategically important port of Alexandria was only 60 miles away. If the Germans broke through, North Africa was lost. Morale among the Desert Rats was low. German tanks dominated the battlefield. One man was given the task of achieving victory. Britain's Lieutenant General Sir Bernard Law Montgomery. Montgomery has been described as being by one of his own subordinates as as quick as a ferret and just about as likable. But the men believed in him because he had this great charisma and confidence. Somehow, Monty was the British version of Rommel. If Monty was on the job, the ordinary Tommy thought he would get the job done. 
On the 23rd of October, Montgomery began the Desert Rats' fight back. They launched Operation Lightfoot. Monty was determined, in his words, to kick Rommel out of Africa for good. On the 23rd of October, the battle begins with this huge, iconic artillery barrage, the night sky lit up by the flashes of hundreds of Allied guns pounding the German positions. Montgomery's plan is the British would launch a feint in the south to draw the Germans south. At the same time, British infantry will push two corridors through the German minefields and through their defences to allow the armour to pass through and attack the German tanks. Rommel was outnumbered. Along a 40-mile front, he had 100,000 men and 675 tanks, compared with Montgomery's 150,000 men and 1,000 tanks. And many of these were new American tanks, especially adapted for desert warfare, like the 30-ton M3 Grant. The M3 Grant had exactly what the desert rats needed, greater firepower. To match the German panzers, a 75mm gun had been added to the right-hand side of the tank. The turret with its 37mm gun was offset to the left for balance. The M3 Grant is really the first tank that the British were able to field in the desert that had a 75mm gun. Previously, they had been fielding smaller caliber weapons. Uh, a lot of the tanks had, for instance, a two-pounder cannon. The Grant really was a surprise to the Germans when they were actually being hit by 75mm shells at distances of more than uh, 1,200 meters. The Grant tank was something of a hybrid because it mounted a 75mm gun in its hull and a 37mm in its turret. This was something of an odd arrangement because the main firepower had less traverse than the smaller turret. The Grant is a modified version of a tank known as the M3 Lee. The British asked for changes to its communication system. The Lee tank actually had a crew of seven individuals. The Grant only had six men, and that was because the British asked for the radios to actually be put in the turret. American tanks had the radio down in the hull. So this allowed the British to have one less man necessary to operate the radio. It sounds like with one less man, it would be very roomy in there. It's really not, it's very tight. The M3 Grant performed well in the desert, but wasn't without its flaws. Most tanks were welded constructions, but the Grant was riveted, which meant that when under fire, it was a hazard to those inside. If those rivets are hit by an incoming shell, they can actually shear off inside the tank and create a ricochet effect that's very dangerous for the crew. The Grant had an aircraft petrol engine built by the American company Wright Continental. Although its top speed was a decent 25 miles per hour, it was a devil to start. It's got an airplane engine in the back, a radial engine, which uh, needs to be cranked uh, before you start the vehicle. It's quite the workout for the individual who gets lucky enough to be chosen to be the man cranking that engine. And you have to spin it about 50 times to make sure the oil gets into all of the cylinders. It still was certainly a significant weapon on the battlefield, and it really uh, improved the British chances of being able to take the Germans on head to head. Despite their new tanks and their numerical strength at El Alamein, for almost a week after Operation Lightfoot began, the Desert Rats had failed to break through the German and Italian lines. The battle is incredibly intense, the attrition in terms of armour on both sides is very high. Montgomery is utterly ruthless. He will not abandon a plan once it's been set in motion. But even he realises that Operation Lightfoot isn't going to achieve final break. At El Alamein, there was another battle going on. A war fought behind the scenes by the engineers on both sides to keep their tanks repaired and operational. Fighting in the desert was punishing for the men and their combat machines. The desert is very harsh terrain. It's largely waterless. 
the rocky surface, it's not all smooth sand, is murderously hard on vehicles. It degrades tank tracks, it shreds tires, the dust clogs engines. Those who maintain World War II tanks today, some former tank crew themselves, are only too aware of the dedication of those tank engineers. A lot is said of the camaraderie that exists between the crewmen that work on one of these vehicles. And having done it myself, you know, you, you never experience teamwork and a sense of purpose when four people, which is the amount of people it takes to run this machine, all have to work in concert in order to navigate over terrain, spot targets, load the correct ammunition, pick up the targets, fire and hit them. In order for all that to work, once that breaks and that vehicle is broken down, another gang of people come up and turn, and in very adverse conditions, such as in the desert, without often the correct equipment in order to fix it, they have to repair this thing in, under fire sometimes and get it back going again. Part of the reason that we do this kind of work is a homage to those people and the people that crewed the tanks in the first place. By early November 1942, Short of fuel and weakened by five days of fighting at El Alamein, Rommel only had 35 serviceable tanks left. Montgomery came up with a plan codenamed Operation Supercharge that he believed would finish off the Desert Fox Rommel once and for all. A combined force of tanks, infantry and artillery would smash their way through enemy lines, destroying their tanks and supply routes. It worked. The German line is fractured, the armour pours through. By the 2nd of November, his tanks shot up and strafed by British planes, because British now have air superiority. Rommel realises the game's up, he's going to have to retreat. But of course, Hitler orders him not to give an inch. He has to stand and die, and it's typical Hitler command. He just thinks it's like some kind of medieval battle where you stand and hold your ground at the last man. Rommel ignores Hitler's command and begins a retreat. And that retreat this time never stops. That retreat goes on till May 1943, when the Germans and the Italians finally surrender at Tunis, and the Desert War is over. Cyril Jolly, a British tank commander, wrote, As the sun rose, it was marvelous to see again the brigade spread out in open battle formation, with the plumes of sand billowing in the wake of each tank and vehicle, as we moved in a wide arc to cut off and encircle the enemy. It was a costly victory. A total on both sides of about 5,000 men were killed at El Alamein. It was a significant turning point in World War II. Before El Alamein, the Allies had never won a major victory. After El Alamein, they never suffered a major defeat. It was the tipping point of the war. A better supported and better equipped British force had finally made up for their humiliation in France. After three years of continuous defeat, of privation, of terror, of German invasion, finally, British armies had done what British armies always did in the past, had won a famous British victory. The pride of Germany's forces, Rommel and the Africa Corps, the best that Germany had, had been defeated by the British Eighth Army. The Desert Rats and their combat machines had ultimately triumphed over the elements and Rommel's army. In a straight-up stand-up fight, the British had finally been the last man left in the ring. And now, with American manpower and American armour, victory over the Third Reich was closer to becoming a reality. <laughs>